panel discussion. Um, her name is Catherine Dole, and she's studying the um, master course in international education and development in the University of Sussex here. And then she's interested in language and education, and she grew, grew up and then being educated in Chile and England, both countries. And also, um, after the degree in modern language, she was teaching French and Spanish in the secondary school in Liverpool. And then she, after that, she joined the SIL, International and International NGO, in order, in order to work for minority language communities. And then also after that, she spent four years working in Thailand for the project, for the minority language projects. And then she's going to present the languages for educational quality and equity in the post-2015 agenda, recent development for minority language um, communities in Thailand. So please welcome Catherine Dolay. Thank you very much. That sounded very grand now. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try. Um, and I'll try and stick to time. Who's doing the little card? We're doing things? that, yeah. Right, okay. I'll do my very best, but I tend to get excited and talk too much. So, um, yeah, I'm talking about languages, as you can probably guess from the um, introduction. And I guess I'm kind of arguing that um, without considering the issue of language, you're not really going to get very far with the goals of quality and equity um, in the post-2015 agenda. And I'm drawing on my work experience in Thailand to illustrate that. So, um, roughly outline, I'll try and start a bit broader. I am going to talk a bit about multilingual education. Not too long in case that's not your thing, but just so that we're on the same page. Um, and look a little bit at what's been happening in Southeast Asia and Thailand. The particular project I've been working with where I'm hoping to go back and do my field research of all of three weeks, because it's a master's, not a PhD. Um, and then some conclusions. So, um, seems a little unnecessary after Yusuf's talk. So, um, the EFA and um, MDGs have been criticised for their narrow focus on university primary um, education, um, enrolment, completing, and forgetting about quality and equity because they weren't equality because they weren't being measured. Um, multilingual societies exist around the world. Um, I think the only country in the world which is monolingual is North Korea. Um, and there are dominant and non-dominant languages in those societies, and it's usually one or the most dominant that gets picked to be the education language. Um, this is a quote here from um, Dutcher, so I'm going to read it because it's quite a good one. She says, It's shocking that the international dialogue on education for all has not confronted the problems that children face when they enter school not understanding the medium of instruction. When they're expected to learn a new language, at the same time they are learning in and through the new language. The basic problem is that children cannot understand what the teacher is saying. Which seems quite obvious, really. But actually, in practice, it's not taken as obvious at all. <clears throat> so, a couple of terms. Language of instruction, sometimes medium of instruction. Um, the language that's being used to teach content, so math, science, history, whatever else it is. Not just a language that you study as a subject, as a foreign language. Bi or multilingual education, um, using one, two or more languages to, for the instruction, not just adding on foreign languages. Um, and there's all kinds of different terms for first language, mother tongue, home language, ethnic language, the vernacular, the local language, minority. I'm going to try and stick to saying first language. If I say another one by mistake, then that's probably what I mean. So, um, I'm arguing that language of instruction affects the quality and the equity of education because children do learn better when they understand the language that they're trying to study in. And it's often the children from minority language groups that are the most marginalized in the education system, and especially girls. Benson has some quite good research on that. Um, from Yusuf's executive summary, um, he talks about the challenge of equity um, in the education for post-2015 post agenda. And if you look at the list there, it talks about indigenous populations, remote rural groups, children in the street, migrants, nomads, children with disabilities, linguistic and cultural minority, minorities, um, being marginalized through the education process. And most of those have some relation 
to language, not necessarily, um, but often. And the high-level panel talks about leaving no one behind, reaching the very poorest. It talks about the bottom 20%, and a data revolution where data is going to be aggregated so you can tell more clearly who is getting left behind and why. Um, and I think these are all relevant to looking at the language that's being used in teaching and learning. Um, by and or multilingual education, there's a lot of research around the world that shows that studying in a first language helps learning. Um, and the strongest models of bilingual education are the ones where children get to keep their own language that they know from home, whatever you want to call it, as long as possible. A lot of research from that comes from the US, I think, but there are other models too. Um, if you just have a few short years introduction to the new language and then say, oh, they've got it, they can do it now, actually the results in the long term go down and the children that get to keep their new language and their first language alongside each other do better in the long term. Um, because, Cummins argues, language development um, in your first language um, affects your second language. So if you're confident, you can reason, you can read in your first language, then that transfers easily to your second language as well. And Cummins also uses um, this picture of two different types of language learning. So the basic interpersonal day-by-day -day skills that you would need for saying, I need to go to the toilet, I forgot my pencil, whatever that is, and the skills that you would need to actually be able to use that language to learn, to learn maths, science, to do a master's. A lot of you are doing master's in a second or third language, so very impressive. But yeah, they're not the same. And often parents and teachers rush to think, oh, well, my children understand that now, so therefore they'll be fine learning in that language. And often that's a step too quick, and it's too fast, and they fall down. A few myths, Benson looks at these myths, they're not true, um, but they relate very well to the popular social discourse um, that exists in most societies. The regime of truth about language and power, um, the either or myth, either you learn your home language or you learn the national language. If you do both, you'll get confused. Actually, it's not true, but a lot of the time it's presented that way as a choice. Parents aren't given this idea of both together. Um, the myth that local languages aren't developed enough to express modern concepts. Well, we didn't used to have the word microwave in English. Yes, new terms do need to be developed, but it's not that some languages are primitive or you know, less and aren't able to express that if, if they're developed that way. The one nation, one language myth um, for national unity well, having a common language to communicate is definitely good, but there are plenty of examples around the world of where trying to squash down ethnic minority languages has actually led to the very opposite of peace. Um, and the idea that parents don't want this bilingual education thing. Um, often, when they're first approached with it, they're scared because they think, oh, what if my child doesn't do as well in the national language? But actually, research shows that when they've had a chance to have an informed decision, and they're not being told to choose home language or national, they're usually very pleased with what happens. So um, this is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which is um, what I'm going to focus on a little bit. So it's not clearly in all the right place. But those are some of the countries. There's 10. Those are the numbers of languages spoken in each of those countries. Now, this does include like the ones that have you know, 20 speakers and are dying languages. But even so, if you ignore those languages, you can tell that one language per country for education is probably not going to do adequate justice to 706 languages in Indonesia, or even 15 in Brunei. Um, there's probably, to give kids a better chance, you need to select a few and not just one. There's been a lot of advocacy going on. UNESCO has been leading um, in Southeast Asia region. I don't know about anywhere else. Um, they've got a position paper, 2003, Education in a Multilingual World. Um, mother tongue matters. Local language is a key to effective learning, so they're targeting it from the quality point of view there. Um, advocacy kit they produced. 
Um, UNICEF ensuring the rights of indigenous children, so coming at it more from an equity point of view. Um, and CEMEO, which is the South East Asian Ministers of Education organisation, also get, got in on the act. We're looking at some policies and experiences, um, so policies and then practice examples of where mother tongues or first languages, whatever you like to call them, are used in education. So, in that atmosphere, we approach Thailand. Languages in Thailand, there are 76, I think it said. Um, Central Thai is clearly the biggest one, 38%. Um, that's what Standard Thai is based on. It's the one spoken near Bangkok. Northeastern Thai, which is Isan, Northern Thai and Southern Thai are related, but different languages. But those other three are all considered dialects, spoken languages. We wouldn't use those for education, even though Northern Thai does have its very own ancient script. But there's something about the national discourse which says Standard Thai is Thai, and if you're Thai, you speak that. Then you've got another 14% who are really lost. They're speaking languages not related to Thai. Some are national languages, so Khmer or Vietnamese coming in. Some of them are indigenous groups that have been there for years. Some of them are other migrant groups. Um, but the language of education is always standard Thai. So, um, yeah, they had a financial crisis, a new education act. So the things that they're talking about a lot in education at the moment, they've got education free and compulsory for nine years, so up to basic education, a lot of decentralization, um, preparing for the knowledge economy and all the jargon that goes for that about a knowledge society and creativity. Um, there are some questions about the pace of the change, whether it's actually worked in practice, um, how much has just been the language has taken on, but actually everything else stays the same underneath. And Hallinger's got some quite interesting research on the role of um, head teachers um, in implementing change. Um, a friend emailed me this the other day and I thought I'd put it in because it's quite interesting. Discipline and assimilation in Thai schools are very important. So this person reflects a drill sergeant's dream of regimentation, which is rooted in the military dictatorship of the past, with discipline and enforced deference prevail. This was an article about um, girls in uh, Thai schools always have to have their hair cut above their ears, and they're talking about maybe not doing that. But actually there's been a big backlash because people are saying, no, this idea of manners and discipline and respect is very important. So you can see how that would kind of clash with the idea of creativity and you know, valuing differences rather than just all being the same. Um, the quote at the bottom is quite revealing. It was from a school vice principal. And he said, well, the government has policies. We're the practitioners. If the government launches new policies, like longer hair, we'll look at them and decide which ones are appropriate for us. So, yeah, there's, you've got to consider this when you think about national level policies, global agenda, and then what actually happens on the ground. There is a new openness to bilingual education. There were some surveys in 2005 and 6 that revealed that children in certain areas of the country have very low literacy rates indeed. And the Ministry of Education sent some people to do some more research to say why. And they came back saying, well, the kids and the children, the, the children and the teachers don't speak the same language. Um, but everybody knows that. And this is what they reflect, they reflect on it. Although many stakeholders accept that teachers and students' languages are different and that this affects the national education outcome, most people are still familiar with a single education system, standard tie. So although they see it's a problem, they wouldn't, they wouldn't change it because you're meant to be teaching them standard tie, so you just drill them harder in standard tie, um, which hasn't worked so well. So since 2007, there have been some pilot projects allowed in government schools using four or five different languages. That's Ministry of Education, UNICEF, Mahidon University. The Foundation for Applied Linguistics is a small Thai NGO. SIL is a big Thai NGO. Um, and there was a national language policy in 2010 and 2012 because a new Prime Minister came in and had to sign in, recognising that minority languages do have some value in education but also in and of themselves. These are the languages and the schools which are piloting bilingual education at the moment using local language plus Thai, 
So you've got Marne, Malayu, Khmer, Mong, and Kokoren. You can see they're mostly in border areas. Um, and the one I'm going to talk to you about at the top there is the Hmong project in the border, near the border of Laos. Um, it started in 2009. It was a regional educational supervisor who requested it, having been to a workshop on Thai as a second language. He heard about this project happening somewhere else and said, oh, I think our students should do that. We could have one too. So it kind of happened a bit at the last minute. Not much preparation, terribly, really. Um, they got three months, three months is the time in which they put all their materials together. So, no comment. <laughs> Ministry of Education, the Regional Educational Services and the Foundation for Applied Linguistics were the ones who were meant to be implementing. I was seconded and working with the Foundation of Applied Linguistics at the beginning of the project, so that's how my connection comes in. So they've got four schools, they're in rural, Hmong-speaking villages. Um, some of the male adults um, Will speak, especially the younger generation, speak Thai. A lot of the women won't necessarily unless they've been through school and they're under 20. Um, there's eight or nine classes per cohort, so across kindergarten, one in all four schools. Some schools have three, some schools have one. So that's the size. The teachers, the government teachers, don't speak Hmong, so you couldn't ask them to implement bilingual education when they couldn't speak it. So they had to hire bilingual teaching assistants who had nine years of basic education from the local village. Um, a Thai-based writing system had to be used as a compromise. There's no written policy on it, or there wasn't at the time, but this was felt to be more appropriate, politically speaking, even though the Hmong have used a Roman-based script for 60 years, and it's the one they, they use across country borders. Um, and the whole project was labelled as using the local language to improve students' Thai and learning achievement. So that was how it was packaged to the people who were asking about it. There's a quick picture of the language progression model. I don't know if it's clear or not. So the top bit is the language used as for teaching and learning for maths, science, all those other things. Um, starts up as Hmong and Thai gradually increases as it goes through. Languages which are taught as a subject, so specifically Thai as a second language or Hmong reading and writing, continue all the way through. Um, I'll come back to that later if you've got any questions on it. Um, grade three is the important grade here. Children have to do exams in Thai after grade three. Teachers. Um, yeah, so you've got a Thai qualified teacher, a Hmong bilingual unqualified teacher, and some socio-cultural tensions, both in terms of hierarchy, education, ethnic group, the lot really. Um, and especially because the Hmong teaching assistant does a lot of the actual teaching for the first part of the project because the children aren't learning much Thai yet. Um, there's a lot of uh, research again on the importance of teachers if you're going to have successful multilingual education, or most kinds of education really. But um, Benson talks about the very high demands on bilingual teachers. They have to be pedagogues, linguists, intercultural communicators, community members, and advocates for the project. Um, and teachers' beliefs about bilingual education, whether it's a good idea or not, is going to affect um, how they implement it, or whether they implement it, or just do their own thing. Um, and in the Mong Thai project, it meant paying two salaries per class as well. Um, government teachers is fine, that's in the normal thing, but the teaching assistants ended up with very small salaries and no sustainable budget, really. Um, I'm planning to go back next week and do a few weeks' work uh, focusing on this idea of the paired teaching. So uh, the teachers and the teaching assistants, um, what are their views of the project? We've had four years of it now. They're approaching the fifth year, which could be the final one if the government doesn't like it. So um, whether their beliefs on bilingual education and its value have changed or not, do they... I'm wondering if there's a difference between what the Hmong teaching assistants see as valuable and what the Thai teachers see as valuable. Um, there may or may not be. And also, just practically speaking, successes and challenges of the implementation have affected people's attitude towards the project from, my, from what I've seen before. Thai teachers who had a big extra workload were prejudiced from the start about whether they thought this bilingual education thing was worth it or not. Um, so I'm planning to go and do some semi-structured interviews um, 
with teachers and teaching assistants as the main focus and a questionnaire to get some more data just on how long have they been there, did they get the training. A lot of them move, it's rural schools, they move in the middle of the year and then they miss the training and they don't know what they're doing and it gets a bit confusing. Um, speaking to the school principals and regional educational services about what they think about this two teacher idea. It's not a standard model really. It happened because there weren't any bilingual teachers. So what do you do by a teaching assistant? It's not something I found an awful lot of research, well any research on yet, in a developing country context. And I'm going in as an insider outsider. I've been with the project before, but I'm not anymore. So um, I'm running out of time. So future of bilingual education in Thailand, I don't know quite frankly. Um, there is a dialogue that's opened at policy level. The bilingual education idea doesn't match with this national identity unity idea. It does match with the quality of education idea, so that might help. This guy here was interviewed on Thai TV. He's a parent of one of the children. He used to be very, very opposed to the project. A year or two ago, he came out with this. My child can read. I think there's a change in the children when they study using Hmong as well as Thai. They enjoy learning. I want this kind of project for children in every school, on every mountain. He's completely turned around by actually seeing his child being able to read better than her siblings in higher grades. And as for the implementation, I think there is a need for more flexibility and new models of how, how are they going to make that work in Thailand. Um, and this is just reflecting back on my same point as before, really. I don't think you can head for quality and equity in education without considering the language of instruction. I think it's a big gaping hole, really. Um, the agenda sets big, zero targets, zero poverty, everyone in education. So I think you could set a big target of every child learning in their own language. Whether that needs to come down smaller and steps, you know, at national level about what's realistic and what can be managed at first. The space for that in the post-2015 agenda as well, we've talked about manageable steps. So I'll stop there, and if you have any questions, I won't necessarily be able to answer them, <laughs> to ask. <laughs> Thank you.